dear Dr. Bosco, after such an eloquent introduction that you gave to me, I am feeling very nervous to speak. <laughs> Dr. Sensor Pinto gave a very enlightening and passionate presentation. And one of the sideline remarks that she made, she said in the period we refer or that he studied in this book, women did not matter. I was just wondering how much the situation had changed. Today on the days, there's one poor man among three gentle ladies. And when Alina made an appeal, how docile the men in the audience were, immediately they got up in response to the nice appeal for a standing ovation, Dr. Sharmila. I'm going to take a clue from the advice of the young son of Sharmila, Ian, to his mother, Mama, relax. We have had very serious talk, something little bit to relax, nothing to do with history. Frederick was saying, Bishop and he had some eye problems. <laughs> Both of them went to the super specialty hospital in Chennai. I did not know that Frederick had followed me, eye problem. And that reminded me about that ear problem that a Jesuit, senior Jesuit had. I know there are Jesuits in the audience, at least Father Tony De Silva and Father Kelvin. I hope you won't mind. I was told that once there was a senior Jesuit, and in the Jesuit institutions, the one who handles money is called minister, house minister. So the senior Jesuit, who was the house minister, normally used to complain of hearing problem, not eye problem, hearing problem. So once a member of the community, normally when Jesuits in those days, I don't know whether things have changed now, as much as the situation of women in the electoral process, this Jes Jesuit member of the community went to this house minister and told him, Father, tomorrow I'm traveling. I am going to preach a retreat. So he said, what happened? He said, I need money for travel. How much? He said. He said, 3,000 for the ticket. He said, I can't hear this side properly. Please go this side. So this Jesuit was smart. Jesuits are very intelligent. None of you will contest that. So when he went to the other side, he told him, Father, I am going to preach a retreat tomorrow. So he said, what happened? He said, I need 5,000 rupees for my travel. He said, no, 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 it was better this side. Go this side back. <laughs> so when people complain whether eye problem or hearing problem, sometimes it can be selective problems. We have to be careful. People who complain of hearing, not being able to see, sometimes they can see much better than they see. Mrs. Alina Saldanya, Honourable Member of the Goa Legislative Assembly and Guest of Honour for today's function, Dr. Celsa Pinto, former Director of Education and Historian, the keynote speaker of today, Dr. Sharmila Paish Martins, Head, Department of History, St. Xavier's College, and today's star, Distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I am really glad to be here this morning. And my first word is of thanks to the one who invited me, Dr. Sharmila Pai Shimartins, the author of the book that was just released today. Every reality that exists in the world has its origin somewhere in the past. And we need to understand the past in order to interpret the present and prepare ourselves for the future. It is here that the historian exercises an indispensable role. Historians spend their lives pursuing the meaning that the past has for the present. They study facts and records that previous generations have left 
in order to help us understand the present and in a certain way shape our future. It is in this context that we need to welcome in the form of the book that we are holding in our hands another significant contribution to the understanding of our past made by a well-known academician who is also the head of the Department of History of our Diocesan St. Xavier's College at Mapsa. Dr. Sharmila, therefore, needs to be congratulated for placing such an important study in our hands today. I can gauge at first sight the importance of the present study as its topic does not seem to have received much attention from scholars so far, thereby creating a certain gap in the historiography of Goa. Dr. Celsa Pinto referred to this point in her keynote address. The book is titled The Encounter with the Ballot in Colonial Goa, 1822-1961, a historical and analytical perspective. As the author explained to me in her letter of invitation, the book deals with elections in colonial Goa, their structure, the electoral processes, the legislation of that time, and most importantly, the underlying currents among political parties and social groups in colonial Goa. This is material enough to gain a new insight into the Goa that was, since the history of elections and of the various political parties in the fray for a century and a half is bound to throw ample light on the important role that they played in the social, cultural, and political dynamics of the Goan society of the time. I am not a historian, so I was curious to know the significance of the period between 1822 and 1961, which this book purports to focus on. And my little research led me to discover that the date marked the fall of the absolute monarchy in Portugal and the birth of the first constitutional monarchy, giving rise to a system of government wherein the monarch shared power with elected representatives of the people. A system, therefore, that created the need for the people to elect their deputies to the parliament. And I stood there transfixed by the thought that Goans had begun to elect their representatives to the Portuguese parliament almost two centuries ago. This was undoubtedly the coming of age of this tiny colony of Portugal, which began to enjoy the privilege of participating in a process which was at least in theory democratic in nature. It was indeed a glorious past, which of course could have been even more glorious had the circumstances been more favorable to us, the colonized. So we welcome the felic felicitous idea that Dr. Sharmila Pais had of offering us a splendid overview and a critical analysis of what happened in Goa during that epoch-making period of 139 years between 1822 and 1961 and in the process of giving us a general but also a vivid idea of what the society of Goa was like in those times. May more such books follow. As a concluding remark, I should say that this book also comes at a time when we ourselves are gearing up for our state elections 
Alina had just referred to it, which will take place in another three months or so. We too are witnessing these days a lot of political movement throughout the state. The birth of new outfits trying to enter the fray and even the emergence of new political alliances. Suddenly, everybody is talking elections. And much like those times gone by, things are really hotting up. It's a wishful thinking, I know. But I would wish that this book is read by people across the length and breadth of our state so that we may learn important lessons not only from our own past experience but also from the experience of our ancestors so that we may exercise our franchise with a sense of responsibility to ourselves and to our state avoiding unnecessary conflicts and rivalries that can only mark the prospects of a peaceful and secure future for us all. Thank you. Congratulations once again, Dr. Sharmila, and God bless you.